So I don't feel like I've given up uh, being at the cutting edge because I'm not at the bench anymore. If anything, I now know more people who are doing even more cool research and get to interact with them on what's coming around the corner. What, I, what attracted me to the, to the industry, what I thought was just remarkable that people are actually paid to be venture capitalists, was the idea that you could take research that had potential and put people around it and, and dollars behind it and create something real. Within Arch and within what I look at, I want to make sure that the investments and the, the science that we're backing has the potential to be truly transformative. So whether it cures a disease, modifies, um, you know, modifies it to a point where it, you know, it's a totally different, uh, different disease, I think. The FDA has, has done some interesting things over the last 12 years. They've actually set the stage for things like um, use of imaging in, in uh, modifying treatments. And some of, the, some of the groundwork that they've laid has not actually been fully deployed by companies. So I, I think that there is room to expand how we progress through the clinic. Um, already agreed, you know, agreed upon with the FDA, or excuse me, their guidance back to companies. Um, I tend to you know, encourage the companies, and the, the companies, I think, like the approach of, of viewing the FDA as a friend, and as soon as you decide that they're not a friend, then that's a bad decision. Um, so we, we don't do that. Uh, so what gets me excited about ARCH is that we look across the spectrum, and we'll do, you know, we'll invest every corner of healthcare, um, and we'll take different, different approaches to investing in those corners of healthcare. Um, not every company needs seven, you know, I can't even figure, nine, nine figures to get started. Um, some need significantly less, and we, we've, you know, we've done that. So the first dollar is into a company called Unity, about $50,000. And we, we felt comfortable putting a small bet on the table because the potential that Unity had, which was to go after aging, was enormous. Um, but there were some big technical risks. So we kind of eyedroppered money into the company in an effort to figure out whether or not the biology was druggable. And once we figured out the biology was druggable, we turned around and raised $116 million in a Series B. So we're, you know, some things require large dollars up front because that's the way the deal comes together, and some things require small dollars. And you know, it's still, still massive opportunity. There's different pools of capital who've come into biotech that change, you know, change some of the dynamic. But I think the biggest driver in these, you know, the, the size of deals is the fact that science now has progressed to the point where you can, you know, you can actually think about developing therapies when you're putting your, your Series A money. Yeah, I would, uh, we started Receptos in 2008, and um, I think if anyone would have told me we were going to sell for over you know, $2 billion, I would have laughed because um, that wasn't what happened in 2008. Um, but there were some really interesting assets percolating at, at Scripps um, out of people's labs that I'd, I'd tracked for many years going back to my early days at GNF and actually as a grad student at, at the Scripps Research Institute. There was also a failed company in San Diego populated with super talented people and led by Bill Rastetter, who is you know, a legend for good reason. Um, so in 2008, the, the crash happens. No, no, no company's getting funded that doesn't have like phase two data. We had a platform and a early uh, compound. And we made the decision to combine the would-be assets out of Scripps and this amazing team that had you know, conclusively proven that their first set of technologies didn't work. And I orchestrated um, the combination of those two. Bill and I worked to you know, combine the team with the assets and, and rolled some of the dollars over and, and created Receptos. So that, that allowed the company to get started in an era where you know, tech, technology platform biotechs weren't getting started. It was one of the very few companies that, that um, was actually funded. Um, Benrock and Arch kind of were the orchestrators of, of the combination, and then Lilly Ventures and Flagship joined us in the Series A, closed that in 2009, so just a mere 12 months, and uh, Series A closed, built the company up, raised a Series B, um, a couple months, a couple years later, uh, Fahim has nine joined, a uh, fabulous CEO. We built out the rest of the team and took the company public shortly after the window opened in 14. 
um, and you know went out at 250 million pre, and you know the stock just rose and rose and rose on lots of lots of positive clinical data, and um, eventually uh, we got bought out by Celgene, which is a great thing to happen because they're a great partner and um, they've they've done a fabulous job of continuing the clinical trials. So if you look at where the women in venture capital tend to congregate, it tends to be here in California. Um, and if you look at the Boston firms, it's not quite as well represented, particularly on the, on the partner level. Um, so I am really excited because I see all these insanely talented associates and principals coming up. And I will be much more excited maybe in you know, three to five years to see some of these women take on um, partner, or managing director, whatever the firms call it, roles, uh, decision-making roles within the firm. And that, um, you know, I think that's going to come. I think it's, you know, helpful to have it on people's minds that it is a little weird to have 20 people in a firm and they all look kind of the same. Um, doesn't mean it's wrong, just it's a little weird. But some companies, in the early days, there are great people working on big ideas with strong investors, but there's a company culture that doesn't allow for um, flexibility. And I think that for what we do in, in early stage venture, in you know, really risky venture, you have to have flexibility where if something's not working, you can change the deck and start over or pivot. The rigidity can come from the investors and the board who have certain expectations. And you know, it's not always management. It can be the people who are putting the money in that they expected to you know, get X for their money, and they're not going to be comfortable if they get Y. And that's, that's a weird position. I, I have a hard time understanding it.